Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about fossils. But first, some follow up. First of all, thank you very much to the Recipe Project's virtual conversation, which not last episode, but the previous episode was part of. They facilitated a really interesting group of presenters and a lot of different types of contributions, our video and our podcast, and there were Instagram stories and Twitter conversations and and a lot of blog posts and uh, another range of other kinds of videos. And it was just really, really fascinating. And we really enjoyed participating. Yes, indeed. And we also hope it paves the way for more of this kind of innovative style of conferencing because it was really an interesting way to develop a conversation mm -hmm. and in many ways much easier to deal with and more much more inclusive yes. than one that is reliant on everybody being in the same physical space. So if and when the contributions are collated into a more permanent online exhibition, which I believe is the intention, we will certainly link to it on the podcast blog and mention it again, because if you weren't able to catch some of the other stuff that was going on during the conference, uh, it's really worth your time to look into it. Second, as a follow-up to our most recent episode, which is about Wonder Woman, we wanted to say thank you to Zed Texas. Or should that be Z Texas? Yeah, it probably should be Z Texas, because I suppose if it's Texas, it's mm. most likely American. Z or Z Texas is a Redditor. The Redditor, in fact, who created the Wonder Woman cocktail recipe that we drank in the last episode. And they listened to the podcast and added an interesting and corrective bit of trivia. Now, I say corrective. I haven't actually looked it up to confirm it. <laughs> so... I don't know, but uh, they mentioned that there was something about Wonder Woman that we could have added. And they said, uh, fun fact, I heard on the point about Wonder Woman being the Justice Society secretary. It was less sexism and more the creator keeping creative control. At the time, Wonder Woman was in a few comic series that she was headlining and that he had control over. So the secretary role was more devised so she could be a member of the Justice Society while allowing her the time to have all of those solo adventures. So I don't know, as I said, exactly how true that is, but it doesn't sound impossible. Yeah, and it possible. is an interesting point. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> so thank you for that feedback. Uh, next, we do have another video that has come out reasonably recently. We just wanted to mention. I guess it'll be almost a month ago by the time this comes out. But Yes. Well, in addition to the recipe video that mm -hmm. we mentioned as being part of the recipe conference, which is one of our more recent videos, even since then, a more recent video on the word Canuck. Why are Canadians called Canucks? Mm -hmm. Which was inspired sort of last minute yeah. by the six-year-old child of ours. <laughs> asking daddy to please make a video for Canada Day because so it was the 150th anniversary of the signing of Confederation. And so I had to do a Canadian word, obviously, and that's about as Canadian as they get, <laughs> though, interestingly... Not from a whole Canadian source. Not from a Canadian source. So. so we'll put a link in the show notes and you can head over to the video channel if you'd like to see that. And last little bit of business before we turn to the main topic of the podcast is that we're putting this out towards the end of July and then we're going to be going on a bit of a vacation with the family. So we won't be putting another podcast out until mid-August. So that it'll miss one regular slot probably or possibly be delayed a little bit beyond that. So we just wanted to give you a heads up about that. But the one we do put out next will hopefully have been recorded at the cottage. Indeed. An another in our series <laughs> of cottage podcasts. <laughs> and then finally, turning to today's episode topic, our drinks. <laughs> Now, we're talking about fossils today and the origins of paleontology and geology. Right. And I did do some digging <laughs> to try to find some uh, properly themed cocktails, but I wasn't able to find any that were appropriate and we had the ingredients for, and there really weren't that many possibilities. So I've decided that we're just going to both go with having something on the rocks. <laughs> See? Cheers. And mine is specifically Scotch on the Rocks. And I think this reflects nicely one of the key characters that you'll hear about in a minute, James Hutton, who was a Scot on the Rocks. <laughs> so basically, we're just going with puns today. Yes. 
for this. And I'm just having gin on the rocks because I, I like gin. <laughs> I don't think there's any reason <laughs> to do with the video other than that. All right. Cheers. Okay. Well, that's quite nice, actually. So now we can turn to listening to the voiceover. So what we're doing today is we're talking about the fossil video that we put out two years two ago, years a little ago. over two years ago. Right. So we'll play the voiceover for you and then we'll come back and discuss some of the things that that brings up and add in some more information about the history of fossils. The word fossil comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to dig or pierce, and makes its way into English through a 16th century French word derived from the Latin verb fodio, to dig. The word fossil originally referred to a rock or mineral dug out of the ground, and appears in English at the beginning of the 17th century. The expression fossil fuel preserves this older sense. No, it's not because it's made out of dinosaurs. It was not until the 18th century, or a little earlier for the adjective form, that fossil gained its more restricted but now most common sense of the petrified remains of ancient living organisms. And these two different but related senses tell us something about the scientific investigations of the 18th and 19th centuries. But more on that in a minute. Though the scientific study of fossils didn't really kick off until the 18th century, people may have noticed them much earlier. Some scholars have argued that fossil remains of prehistoric megafauna may have inspired Greek myths about large monsters and heroes of giant stature. For instance, finding mammoth tusks in an area that hadn't even heard about elephants yet may have led to stories of the gigantic Caledonian boar, and the Greek historian Herodotus reports that the Delphic oracle told the Spartans to find the bones of the hero Orestes, and when they dug up some huge bones near their border, they figured they'd found him and reburied the skeleton in a lavish tomb. According to one scholar, the Spartan success with Orestes kicked off a pan-Hellenic bone rush, with every city wanting its very own monster bones, much like the bone rush of the 19th century. But more on that later too. There are many classical intrusions into this story, for instance in the history of the complicated overlap between geology and paleontology. One of the major debates in 18th and 19th century geology was between the Neptunists and Plutonists. You see, people noticed that rocks were arranged in layers, which came to be known as strata from the Latin for bed coverings or paved road, and also that fossils were contained in these strata. And most confusingly, there were fossils of sea creatures on mountaintops. So two schools of thought arose to explain this. Neptunists, named after the Roman god of the sea, said that the world was originally covered by a muddy ocean, and rocks were formed as the water receded or dried up, leaving layers of sediment, and since then the earth had been basically unchanging. Plutonists, named after the Roman god of the underworld, pointed out that fossils weren't found in all strata and maintained that new rocks were formed by a continuing process of volcanoes, named after the Roman blacksmith god Vulcan, and earthquakes, though this left open the question of fossilized shells on mountaintops. Meanwhile, the 18th century was also the age of reason and the enlightenment. Classical harmony and symmetry were the aesthetics of the day, and this way of thinking governed the sciences as well. The great taxonomist Carl Linnaeus set about classifying all living things, with the belief that God had created a perfect and unchanging order, and all humans had to do was categorize and name it. He developed the binomial naming system that we still use today, made up of two Latin names to identify the genus, Latin for clan or family, and species, Latin for type or appearance. But toward the end of that century and into the next, as the unruly passions of Romanticism, which was really into the chaos of nature, began to challenge the neoclassical order, the ordered view of the natural world was about to shatter as well. Continuing in Linnaeus's task of classifying animals was Georges Cuvier, who practically wrote the book on comparative anatomy. It was said that he could reconstruct the shape of an entire animal from a single bone through the principle of the correlation of parts. The sharp tooth of a carnivore implied a particular jaw shape, which implied a particular skull shape, and so forth. This was demonstrated when American President Thomas Jefferson, a fossil fanatic, started a campaign of sending over to Europe specimens of animals of unusual size to counter the French naturalist the Comte de Buffon, who claimed American animals were small and degenerate compared to the European ones, and in doing so, inadvertently kicked off American paleontology. Cuvier, starting with a single tooth that the Americans had sent, was the first to formally describe and name the American mastodon, and I bet you didn't expect that word to mean nipple tooth from the Greek for breast and tooth, because of the titillating shape of the teeth. They were initially confused with mammoths until Cuvier's work established them as a distinct but related species. The name mammoth, by the way, comes through Russian, ultimately from the finno ugric root meaning earth horn, because mammoth remains having been found in the ground, they were believed to have been a burrowing animal rather like a mole, 
And as a side note about Thomas Jefferson, the word mammoth was first used as an adjective meaning huge to describe not an animal of unusual size, but a cheese wheel of unusual size that was presented to the president. But getting back to Cuvier, he also studied the strata and noticed that certain fossils were only found in certain layers and then disappeared, and this led him to be one of the first to really suggest the idea of extinction. He proposed the idea of catastrophism which fit in with the Neptunism of the geologists, that there were a series of floods that periodically caused certain species to go extinct which were then, somehow, replaced by new ones. Cuvier's findings in France fit with those of an Englishman, William Smith, who is so important to the study of strata that he is sometimes credited with coining the term stratigraphy, the first recorded instance of the word refers to his work, and was nicknamed William Strata Smith. Smith was a surveyor working for a coal company and realized he could work out the relative ages of strata by the type of fossils they contained, and after much study produced a geological map of Britain showing all the different strata, a map which was sadly immediately plagiarized. Another proponent of the flood theory was an eccentric theologian cum geologist and paleontologist William Buckland, who was also significant as the first to formally describe a dinosaur, which he called Megalosaurus, from its fossil remains. The name Megalosaurus is from Greek, meaning big lizard, and perhaps unfortunately replaced the Latin name originally given to the fossilized end of a femur which was the first of its bones to be found, scrotum humanum, because of its resemblance to, well. As for the eccentric Buckland himself, he preferred to do his fieldwork while wearing his academic robes, and having pioneered the study of coprolites, fossilized feces, he had a table made with inlaid specimens, and only told his guests what it was made out of after they'd eaten off it. He also had odd tastes in food, being obsessed with trying many unusual animals such as sea slugs, crocodile, and blue bottle flies, and was apparently fond of toasted mice. He was also rumoured to have eaten the mummified heart of Louis XIV, and he was purported to have properly identified a dark stain on the floor of a cathedral which was thought to be the blood of a martyr as actually bat urine, by tasting it. But all of this eccentricity didn't go to waste as he was known for using humour and buffoonery in his lectures at Oxford University to keep his students interested and entertained. Shocking. And Buckland is particularly important to this story because of one of those students, Charles Lyell. Lyle, disagreeing with his wacky teacher Buckland and the other Neptunists and catastrophists, instead turned to the work of a man who died the year Lyle was born. This farmer-turned-geologist, the Scotsman James Hutton, who held to the Plutonist school, proposed the theory of uniformitarianism, that the gradual and ongoing processes of erosion and sedimentation along with ongoing volcanism could account for the geological evidence, and that these processes must have been happening in the same way for a very long time, with no need for great catastrophes or floods. He even applied this gradualistic notion to living things with a kind of proto-theory of evolution through natural selection, but unfortunately Hutton was such a bad writer that his ideas came close to going completely unnoticed. Hutton was part of the so-called Scottish Enlightenment, and as such palled around with other Scottish notables of the day, and along with moral philosopher Adam Smith and chemist Joseph Black formed a dining club called the Oyster Club, soon to be joined by mathematician John Playfair. Playfair, realising Hutton's writings needed to be reworked, wrote a summary of them explaining Hutton's uniformitarianism, and it's through this that Lyle got on to the idea. Lyle wrote his own book promoting and popularising the idea, also providing the additional evidence of fossils in strata that ran under volcanic mountains, which demonstrated the extreme age and slow pace of everything. And this book made a big impact on Lyle's friend, Charles Darwin, who went on to formulate his own idea of evolution through natural selection, seemingly unaware of Hutton's earlier musings. So Darwin's theory only further inflamed the bone rush going on among the fossil hunters for further proof of evolution and extinction and the search for the so-called missing links between one species and another, such as proof of the theory that birds were descended from dinosaurs. American bone hunter Othniel Charles Marsh supported that theory with his study of the first fossil specimens of a toothed bird, Ichthyornis, from the Greek meaning fish bird. Marsh himself hadn't uncovered the fossil, which was actually found by geologist Benjamin Franklin Mudge, who sent the fossil to Marsh for scientific classification. Mudge had originally had an arrangement to send fossil finds to Edward Drinker Cope, Marsh's hated rival in what has become known as the Bone Wars, but Marsh convinced Mudge to send the Ichthyornis fossil his way, so Marsh beat Cope out as the classifier of this crucial fossil. The Bone Wars was the intense and often underhanded professional and personal competition between Marsh and Cope, two of the most important paleontologists of the 19th century, 
Not only did they attack each other in print, but they poached each other's quarries, descending to bribery, theft, and even dynamiting fossils to keep them from falling into each other's hands. And at the end of it all both were left broken and financially ruined men. Though often destructive, their competition to discover the most species led to the classification of some of the most iconic dinosaurs, Triceratops, Allosaurus, Diplodocus, and Stegosaurus. Sometimes their haste to one-up each other led to mistakes, like misidentifying as new animals fossils of species that had already been discovered, as in the famous case of Brontosaurus. Marsh had discovered and named the Brontosaurus, from the Greek meaning thunder lizard, but it was later decided that the fossil find was really a specimen of the previously discovered Apatosaurus, so officially the name Brontosaurus was dropped except in the popular imagination where it persisted as one of the most famous dinosaur species. But recently, in early 2015, a re-examination of the fossil has shown that there were actually enough differences to classify Brontosaurus as a separate species again. I'm sure Marsh would have been just as pleased as the eight-year-old dinosaur lover in all of us. Of course fossil evidence for the evolution of humans from earlier primates was also sought and found too, including such species as Java Man, now classified as Homo erectus from Latin meaning upright person, and Neanderthal, so called because it was first discovered in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, and the principles of stratigraphy became a central precept of the study of the physical remains of human activity, such as artifacts or structures. In other words, archaeology. One interesting recent archaeological discovery is the oldest known remains of a bed made by early humans in the Subudu cave in what is now South Africa some 77,000 years ago. This mattress was made out of layers of sedges which have insecticidal properties to keep the pests away, with a layer of leaves on top, and was big enough for a whole family to sleep on, giving us clues to the social arrangements and behaviours of early humans. What's more, it appears to have been used over a period of 39,000 years, being periodically burned and then re-layered with fresh sedges and leaves. So the bed itself is made up of strata, or bed coverings in Latin remember, of fossilized plants accumulated over thousands of years. Which is particularly appropriate since the word bed comes from the same Proto-Indo-European root that gives us fossil, only through the Germanic branch of languages instead of Latin. It's a matter of some speculation why a word that meant to dig came to mean a place for sleeping, but perhaps it had to do with the notion of a hollow dug out of the ground, like a den giving us a linguistic clue to the sleeping arrangements of the past. In Old English the word bed could refer to a place to sleep as well as a garden bed where you might dig, and by the beginning of the 17th century the word bed could refer to a layer or stratum, like a geological bed, a lake bed, or a bone bed containing fossils. All right, so there's quite a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, that's to, a, a dense one. Yeah, to unpack. Maybe I'll just start off with a little bit of expansion on that one point about the ancient fossils. Uh, sure. I don't have a lot to add really because you've included sort of the highlights of the theory, but I just wanted to mention among other things the name of the person who you mentioned some scholars and you, we didn't include the, her name, but the person whose theory it is and who is responsible for a lot of the work that's been done in the last 10 to 20 years on what the ancient world's relationship to fossils was is Adrienne Mayer, whose name may be familiar if you listened to the last episode, because she also is the one who is writing about real Amazons and right. the connection of Amazons to historical peoples. But before she did Amazons, she did quite a well-known book on fossil hunters, it's called, and it's about the ancient world's interest in fossilized bones and fossils mm -hmm. of all sorts. And I'll link to that in the show notes. I actually was looking, she's also written a couple of articles, and I was looking in particular at one article which brings a lot of this material together that's in the Oxford Handbook of Animals in Classical Thought and Life. And I'll give a link to that as well. So what Adrian Mayer is doing is looking at the really quite extensive amount of classical references in literature. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot, unlike for the Amazons, where a lot of our material is very strongly mythical and you have to build quite a lot of supposition onto quite few pieces of information in terms of what the Greeks are thinking about. For fossils, there's really quite a wealth of literature. She catalogs in her book, she says, at least 100 references to things that can be quite legitimately seen as fossils mm -hmm. and almost certainly must have been. And that's a lot for, you know, for the ancient world, that's a lot of evidence. Yeah. So the ones that you mentioned in the, in the video, Orestes and the tusks of the Caledonian boar, which Pausanias says were kept in a temple, these three feet long curved tusks, 
and that Augustus then removed to Rome to be part of his little museum of odd ancient animals. She suggests that those may well have been mastodon tusks, and there were also other kinds of uh, prehistoric elephants' tusks that were dug up. Uh, there's an interesting story about one place in, I think it's the Near East, that had tusks that they believed that they kept digging up and they believed it to be evidence for a particular mythical beast. Right. But then later after the fourth century's uh, encounters with elephants with Alexander and later on as ele elephants became more well known in the Greek world, they revised their opinion and decided that, no, these must be evidence of elephants. elephants being in the area. And they, well, specifically, they kept to a mythical theme. Specifically, they said that they must have come with Dionysus when Dionysus invaded from the east because uh, the story of Dionysus is that he comes from the east conquering, having conquered India, he then comes back to Greece. So they suggested these must have been the elephants that came with Dionysus. So they keep the mythical, but they update their interpretation of them to match with something new that they learned about the world. And that's a really interesting piece of information. Mm -hmm. It shows you what they're doing. And I think what I really like about Mayer's work in this particular case is... She certainly suggests that a lot of the stories about ancient animals and also the idea that heroes used to be bigger than humans, which right. is a very important sort of epic, talks about that all the time, that the heroes used to be twice the size or three times the size of men now. And or that there were giants, you know, actual giants, that the stories of giants fighting against the gods. She doesn't say those necessarily came only from finding fossil remains, because, of course, there's lots of good psychological reasons why you might imagine those sorts of things. But she does say there's a very good chance that finding a lot of bones and fossil remains will have influenced the way they thought about what those looked like and will have influenced their perceptions of those kind of mythical ideas. And I think that that's absolutely legitimate and makes sense. Um, she points out a couple of things just to give a little more foundation to this. It isn't just saying, well, people everywhere find fossils, so they must have found some fossils. Not only are there a number of stories, Pausanias is one of our best sources for this because he wrote this sort of tour guide to the ancient Mediterranean. Right. So he talks about all the strangest things and he talks a lot about various temples that had these kinds of relics on display, mm. either then or had had in the past. But she points out that many of the stories of where things were found correspond to places that modern paleontologists know are productive fossil beds. Right. So they are, they don't all, some of the things that we have in the ancient world don't correspond to them, but many of the places that they say things were found correspond to places where that kind of megafauna Would be. fossils do are now found, mm -hmm. you know. So it isn't just supposition. There's mm -hmm. a good reason to think that they would be finding that. And those types. Often the stories about it that Pausanias and others give, give, you know, measurements hmm. and details about how it comes out of the rock or that it's weathered out of a shoreline or something like that. Yeah. They give good circumstantial evidence that this is a particular kind of a fossil from a particular period right. that matches with what we know is, is found there. So, I mean, that's a lot more than just saying, oh, people might find fossils. Right. And there's a couple of other pieces she she points out that in the Mediterranean, because there's a fair amount of seismic activity and because of the kinds of rock, fossils are, are going to tend to, first of all, be from megafauna. That's the specific kind rather than dinosaurs. Right. They're going to be the uh, mammals, mammals, mammalian yeah. mostly. But they're also more likely to have been jumbled up and displaced and to come to come to the surface as a result of sort of rock movement and seismic movement. And that the more fragile bones, including skulls, are likely to have been broken. Hmm. So that mainly they're going to find things like leg bones yeah. and hip bones, yeah. which is in fact what we tend to see. And that those pieces, not in an assemblage, but just by themselves, are very easily then, you know, you could imagine them being human, for right. instance, or from giants. Because if you just see a leg bone or a femur, there's really right. Right. very little if you're not an expert to distinguish that of an elephant from that of a big person. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, as she contrasts it with the sort of Central Asian context, right. where the rock formations tend to have these well-preserved, complete skeletons mm. of dinosaurs, which weather out to the surface as a whole. Right. And then you get a much better sense that, that this is a particular kind of animal. And then we get, you know, the possibility that that's where stories of dragons come from. Right. Uh, she points in particular to the idea that the protoceratops often hmm. come to the surface. There's a lot of protoceratops fossils remaining. And it has been suggested that that influenced the Scythian stories of griffins with their beaks ah. that guard nests of gold because the areas that they're found in are also areas where there's gold, gold. deposits. Right. So, you know, that's a 
a possibility that that particular animal affected that particular myth. So I just thought I'd bring that up. You mentioned the Herodotus story about Orestes, which is one of the most famous. And then after that, we have things like Theseus's bones and Pelops' shoulder blade and huh. things like that being found. You know, those are the the big examples of it, but there are more. And I suggest that if anyone's interested in that idea, that how this could have affected mythical beasts and stories about heroes, to look up Adrian Mayer and to find her book, because it is a really interesting story and there's a lot of ancient evidence about it. And I thought the other thing that was interesting is she's not just saying it affects myth, though it does, but also talks about how the ancient world interacted with these fossils. Hmm. You know, it's not just that they found them and said, ah, that must mean that they were big people. Done. They became relics that they used in, um, put in temples. They also used them to legitimize power. You know, that's Hmm. what that bone rush was about, was about finding your heroic ancestors so that you could lay claim to legitimacy and power in a particular region. Mm -hmm. You know, you you have now the bones of the ancestors. Mm -hmm. You really are the one in charge. So they used them to incorporate into power. And then we have later Roman emperors, quite a few of them, who established sort of curiosity collections, like early museums, private collections, of these kinds of interesting exhibits. And so I I like the discussion that's going on in her work of what wasn't happening was you weren't getting the philosophers slash scientists discussing it because the leading theories did not really have room for changing fauna. Right. They were really about fixity of species. Mm. So they couldn't really deal with extinct animals. They could incorporate the idea of the sea creatures found at the tops of mountains because they had the flood stories. stories, So you could use that as for a flood story. So that did get incorporated into the natural sciences. But these other types of sort of extinct animals, they got incorporated into a vision of the world that did see the world as changing, but it was a mythical and sort of common every day. So everyday people could understand this idea of deep time with real changes from the past to the present, while the philosophers, for other reasons, were more often rejecting those kinds of ideas Mm. for reasons that were good to them too. But so you see them them kind of being incorporated in some parts of the culture, but not to others. Right. And I think that that's all a a really interesting discussion to have. So I would recommend that work to you and I will link to it on the podcast blog page. And that's pretty much all I wanted to add from that uh, element that you mentioned. Okay. Well, I guess the next thing that I wanted to talk about was some other uses of the word fossil in English. Mm-hmm. You know, before the, the, the senses of the, the word fossil that I talked about, anything that's dug up from the ground or, you know, the more modern right. sense of fossil. There was, in fact, an earlier in the 16th century uh, use of the word to refer to fish, but not the fossilized remains of fish, but actual living fish. Like the way people talk about living fossils now, like the coelacanthus. Sort of, but with a slightly different implication Mm -hmm. in that they were thought to live in underground water. So they were fossil in the sense that they were under the ground. Oh, okay. Right. Which there are like cave fish. Yeah. Yeah. So here here are a couple of um, citations taken from the Oxford English Dictionary. The ancient philosophers affirm that there have been found fishes under the earth who, for that cause, they called fossils. So that gets the sense of it. And here's another one. Where these fossil fishes are found, there are subterranean waters not far off by which they are conveyed thither. So, again, it's right. this idea Native. of subterranean waters, subterranean fish, fish right. called fossils fossil, okay. or fossil fish. And, of course, the other uh, sense of fossil that we have now is as a metaphor. We talk about something yes, being right, fossil, right. you know, in other words outdated, outmoded, Mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that expression or that that use of the word seems to be first used by Ralph Waldo Emerson when he wrote, government has been a fossil, it should be a plant. And I like that, that distinction, right? right? It it, it's become fixed, unmoving and dead. It should be something that changes Mm -hmm. and grows. Right. So that's quite a quite a nice passage. And uh, a number of other literary uses of this metaphor that are perhaps worth quoting. First of all, from Charlotte Bronte in The Professor, uh, she writes, When a man endures patiently what ought to be unendurable, he is a fossil. And from Herman Melville in The Confidence Man, he writes, The working or serving man shall be a buried, bygone, a superseded fossil. 
And this, of course, kind of reflects, this metaphor reflects nicely on the changing science that uh, right. that was described in the piece, where scientists and their theories can become themselves fossils, hmm. outmoded. Yeah. But it also, you can only talk of fossils in this metaphor once, once you, you have, have the idea mission. of evolution yeah. and change over time. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Darwinian evolution, but you do have to have the idea of change over time. Yeah. And that fossils are a remnant of something that came before and is lost. Yeah. Which, as we just said, if it's you, if you have a vision of an un, a an fixity of one. species, for yeah. instance, you can't have fossils. Mm -hmm. So it's an, it's showing you how these ideas do become transmitted and generalized into society. Right. To the point that they become metaphors, breathing living metaphors about <laughs> Not dead things. Not fossilized ones, yes. <laughs> yes. There's another nice set of connections that I didn't mention in the video or in the voiceover, voiceover to, to the, the video. video. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it starts off with the etymology for the word volcano, which I did mention briefly, the idea of, of volcanoes and, and Vulcan in terms of volcanism. Mm -hmm. But the word volcano comes into English in the early six, uh, sorry, early 17th century from Italian, which is why it has its particular form. Right. It does not, so not directly o. from Latin. Yeah. yeah, because as Doctor Who told us, the Romans don't have a word for volcano, volcano yeah. until after Pompeii, which is just not true. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, originally, the word does indeed come from the name of the Roman god Vulcan, mm -hmm. as it was believed that he lived in Mount Etna. And as chance would have it, it was the study of Etna that gave Charles Lyell the evidence of fossil shells in strata that ran under the mountain. This is the crucial key to under to, to make the, the right, breakthrough right. in understanding that he did. Um, so it was while he was studying the, the, the strata at Etna that he came to this conclusion. And so he was able to estimate the age of fossils by, you know, seeing how quickly does a volcano produce additional layers right. and so how, how it, you can how sort of work can build out up those strata yeah. And, yeah. and so he was able to work out that those fossils must be immensely old right and it's fitting that it was therefore you know vulcan's abode right uh, as it were that was the home of this discovery mm -hmm. and it's interesting too that the name vulcan is not itself originally latin they don't know for sure where it comes from but it's possibly borrowed from etruscan Mm -hmm. Or it could be connected to Minoan, sorry, Minoan Welkhanok, which is ultimately from Hittite Valhanasis. You can sort of hear the, sa the yeah. sound of the word in that. So that's one possibility of where the, the word, word comes, comes from. from. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it itself has many sort of layers of its history, that, that particular word. Mm -hmm. But getting back to Lyle, though he was friends with, as I said, Charles Darwin, he didn't immediately accept Darwin's theory and proposed the idea that geological and biological history might be cyclical and that older forms might return. Mm. And he was kind of ridiculed for this idea by a fellow scientist, Henry de la Beche, who produced a famous cartoon called Awful Changes in which... Um, oh, right. You, you used that in the I used video, that. didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Not for this, to illustrate this exactly, but... Yeah. But uh, yeah, Lyle is is depicted as an ichthyosaur lecturing right. to, to right. other ichthyosaurs. And <laughs> he's a fossil. <laughs> he's a fossil, yeah. But obviously, eventually, mm -hmm. Lyle came around to Darwin's model, as uh, most of the scientists of the day did. It's, of course, significant that he is pictured as an ichthyosaur, as de la Beche was a close friend of Mary Anning, and uh, I want to talk about her in a minute, but de la Beche produced, so she, she was a major fossil finder in her day and one of the few women working in right. this field. Right. And de la Beche also produced a picture titled Duria Antiquor of An Anning's various discoveries to raise money for her. And this sort of ties into what I'm going to say about her, but um, she was in some financial difficulties as opposed to, you know, the men working in the field who are right, often able right. to support themselves or, or well, didn't they, have to support didn't themselves. Have to support yes, themselves. And so he, he drew this famous picture outlining her discoveries. Mm-hmm. And as a final side note for de la Beche, he once took the role of test vomiter in the investigation <laughs> of overflowing privies conducted by Lion Playfair, uh, who I've mentioned before. Yes. Yep. He was the one to first suggest chemical warfare. And so I mentioned that. I think that story about him. In um, uh, Beef. 
in beef. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Dilabesh was the other fellow involved in that particular task. Right. <laughs> Test vomiter. Put that on your business cards. Yes. <laughs> So I mentioned the, the Oyster Club. Yes. And... Uh, One of your favorite topics, dining clubs. Dining clubs, yeah, which were really important to the progress of not only the sciences, but various fields of investigation and thought in the 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a fascinating topic to me how these sort of dining clubs gather the, the sort of leading researchers yeah. of their day. Yeah and the ex how the exchange of ideas happened right. in a time before you know professional so societies in fact when scientists was not a professional activity occupation and when those professional societies that were being formed well there were they were some there, there were, were societies there were starting that, to be but, they, yeah, but a lot like of them the, were the coalescing around so those forth. kinds yeah. of dining clubs dining i mean that's clubs, what yeah. they grew out of yeah. to a large extent the lunar society mm -hmm. royal society you know those things mm -hmm. yeah. and so there were a number of these these types of clubs there's the club Mm -hmm. um, whose members included uh, Adam Smith, David Garrick, Edmund Burke, Samuel Johnson, um, William Jones, a number of, you know, important people. There was mm -hmm. uh, the Poker Club. Again, Adam Smith seems to have been a member of a lot of these <laughs> dining clubs, but also included um, David Hume, Joseph Black. Right. And the X Club, uh, which was a little bit later in the 19th century, which includes Thomas Henry Huxley, T.H. Huxley. Yeah. Huxley. So it's it's interesting that these, you know, we have these gentlemen scientists who, mm -hmm. who are not, you know, supporting themselves through their work, but in fact are, you know, wealthy. And also aren't, to the, a large part, academics. That yeah. is, most of them mm -hmm. are not lecturers, though no. some of them lecture as well. Yes. But it's not the job they do. The, at this point, a lot of the mm -hmm. universities aren't as formalized either. Of no. course, mm -hmm. I mean, they exist, but mm -hmm. people can lecture there and do other things. They don't have to be a full-time professor. Yeah. So they aren't even... They're not just not supporting themselves through science, but they also aren't employed in it. Yes. For money or not, yeah. really. In the way that we tend to think now, as every scientist or academic, you know, is scholar is going to be a, paid for the, the specific research. Paid for their work or in some way affiliated, at least, yeah. with some kind of institution. Yeah. Yeah. And that just wasn't the case. Yeah. No. <clears throat> That's what those clubs were in a way. They were beginnings, the beginnings of institutional affiliation. Yeah. It, it is interesting to note that this work is being done by these, you know, essentially amateurs, but there is a certain class mm -hmm. element to this, of course, because you have to be able to have the leisure mm -hmm. to spend your time on your on your vocation, your hobbies, your hobbies. And you have to have had the education in the first place to get there. Yeah. I mean, they may be self-taught in a sense in the actual specifics of their field because there was not. Most of those universities didn't, in fact, even have lectures or degrees in many of these mm -hmm. fields. But in order to be able to do the reading you needed to in Latin and in other languages, yes. you had to have gone to high class education. You, yeah. just, you simply could not be from anything other than the top of the middle class and up, basically, to have got that kind of education and then to have the money and the leisure time to spend your time doing it. And this would often kind of be a restriction, therefore, mm -hmm. to others trying to to do research in these fields. For instance, so I mentioned the 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 situation of Smith, Strata Smith, William Strata Smith, yeah. who I said his work was um, plagiarized. It seems to have come down, in fact, to class snobbishness. Mm. Um, so indeed, he was Strata Smith was indeed often dismissed or even kind of screwed over mm -hmm. for his his work taken um, advantage of taken yeah. advantage of by the sort of geological in crowd as it were in particular there was one man who seemed to have persecuted him George Bellus Greenborough who was the one who plagiarized and then undercut the selling price of his his great map his oh, great geological right, map right that he spent so long doing doing yeah. and someone else sort of steals it and then sells it for less for less right. uh, which he could afford to do cuz he was a cuz he didn't need to make money from it make money from it and so poor Smith ended up somewhat destitute and hard, hard for money. He spent time in a debtor's prison. He only really achieved real recognition for his work towards the end of his life. But he did at least have that. Before he died. Before well, that's died. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but of course, it's not only classist, but a very sexist period. period. Well, and before you even get to that. So that's the thing about those dining clubs. Yes. Is because they were the venue for so much of this exchange of ideas and of information and for people who would support publication and do all of that stuff. But they weren't 
open to everyone. A gentleman's club is a, a gentleman's, gentleman's club, club and yeah. it is open only by invitation probably yeah. and will definitely be restricted on class and then as the point you're about to make on gender as well. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's an extreme barrier to entry, really. Mm -hmm. Many people wouldn't have been in a position to contribute anyway because they'd not had the opportunities in their life. But if they were, I'm sure Strata Smith wasn't welcome at any of those clubs. No. And yeah. therefore, he's completely excluded. It, it's like having a class barrier to yeah. university, mm -hmm. which, of course, what is what tuition fees and other expenses mm -hmm. can end up being, but an even more extreme one where people will literally just turn you down because you're not in the right class, even if you have the money. Yeah. So you have a, a really restrictive situation going on there. And so I wanted to, in addition to highlighting, you know, someone like Strata Smith, I wanted to highlight some of the women, two in particular, who were important to this revolution of thought. Mm -hmm. The first is Mary Anning, who I mentioned uh, a moment ago. She was a, an important fossil hunter. And again, her, her work was downplayed by the scientific community. But she's particularly important to this story because she's the one that got William Buckland interested in coprolites. Right. His, his, consuming his consuming passion, passion. shall we say. <laughs> She also was instrumental in the discovery of the ichthyosaur. And so, yeah, she so she connects to, to Buckland. And it's the other connection with Buckland that I want to highlight as well, which is Buckland's wife. And there's a really nice story about how Buckland met her. And I'm going to read the passage from their daughter's biography of her father mm -hmm. that she wrote. Her daughter is named Elizabeth Oak Buckland Gordon, and she writes, Dr. Buckland was once traveling somewhere in Dorsetshire and reading a new and weighty book of Cuvier's, which he had just received from the publisher. A lady was also in the coach, and amongst her books was this identical one, which Cuvier had sent her. They got into conversation, the drift of which was so peculiar that Dr. Buckland at last exclaimed, You must be Miss Moreland, to whom I am about to deliver a letter of introduction. He was right, and she soon became Mrs. Buckland. Mm -hmm. She is an admirable fossil geologist and makes models in leather of some of the rare discoveries. It's a lovely story. <laughs> yeah, and it was she who, who described then and, and did the illustrations for a lot of her husband's finds and she her own, did. presumably, right? That was her yeah. big one of her big contributions. Yeah, she, she did. In fact, even before um, working with her husband, she had done work with Cuvier. That's how they knew each other. She'd done right. illustrations for Cuvier. So she was working in the field as a as a an important illustrator of, mm -hmm. um, of of these discoveries. Which, just to point out, in case it isn't obvious, that's not just an ornamental thing. In a time before photography, being the illustrator of scientific yes. specimens is really doing important. the science. Yeah. It's yeah. not just sort of an additional thing. Without good scientific illustrations, the things may not may as well not exist. Yeah. In terms of their con contribution to science, so. So a little bit more about Mary Buckland from that same source. Mary Moreland, whose mother died when she was only an infant, was the eldest of a large family of half-brothers and sisters. The greater part of her childhood was spent at Oxford, where she resided with the famous physician Sir Christopher Pegg, whose childless wife took a great delight in the lovable and intelligent child. In the university city, and perhaps through her acquaintance with the learned professor of mineralogy, she acquired that love of natural science which was such a joy to her through all her life. Within a few hours of her death, she was working at the microscope, ever looking expectantly for a clear light in the next world to be shed on the wonders learnt here. Sir R. Murchison, writing of the happy union between Buckland and his wife, calls Mrs. Buckland a truly excellent and intellectual woman who, aiding her husband in several of his most difficult researches, has labored well in her vocation to render her children worthy of their father's name. And indeed, their honeymoon was a year-long geological tour. So <laughs> it's nice that they uh, shared such a passion and that they could, you know... We did go on honeymoon to a <laughs> Roman town with medieval remains in it, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> and their son, Frank, went on to be a noted naturalist as well. And he also purportedly shared his father's habit of zoophagy, the eating of strange animals. <laughs> um, so that was a family tradition, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, he writes about his mother. Not only was she a pious, amiable, and excellent helpmate to my father, but being naturally endowed with great mental powers, habits of perseverance and order, tempered by excellent judgment, she materially assisted her husband in his literary labors and often gave to them a polish which added not a little to their merit. 
Not only with her pen did she render material assistance, but her natural talent in the use of her pencil enabled her to give accurate illustrations and finished drawings. She was also particularly clever and neat in mending broken fossils. It was her occupation also to label the specimens. So I think her contribution to this cannot be, you know, overstated. Yeah. It is interesting still to hear the very gendered language in which Indeed. her description, you know, her as virtues, a yeah, yeah, as a helpmate and mm -hmm. her neat mending. And, you know, all, yeah. all it's very, it, he's at pains to make her sound like a model woman mm. at the same time as, as she's yeah. intelligent so that, you know, it doesn't reflect poorly on her femininity, clearly. Yes. People are the product of their times. But nonetheless, you can read beyond that, I think, to see the strength of, of what she's doing. Yes. And had mm -hmm. she been given the opportunities to be more than a helpmate, yes. I'm sure she would have been uh, quite able to do the work independently on her own. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't going to be an opportunity she yeah, was going to get. In those mm -hmm. times, no. And so one final thing that I wanted to return to is the subject of that mammoth cheese that <laughs> Jefferson received. So on that topic, before you continue, I did want to put in a plug for Laura Carlson's Feast podcast. The Feast podcast, she was on, of course, during our recipe discussion. And as she mentioned then, they have an episode about the mammoth cheese. Mm -hmm which goes into a bunch of detail tells that, the whole story yeah that you can't in the video yeah and uh really goes into this whole tradition of presidential cheeses <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful a... that we can say the phrase presidential cheese <laughs> the tradition of presidential cheeses so i really recommend that i'll put it in the show notes and on the topic of the feast podcast as she also mentioned during that episode there's a feast podcast episode about the dinner inside the dinosaur that is from very much the same period this yeah. period of the early paleontology um it's specifically from the crystal palace dinosaur exhibits. dinosaur exhibit so it's yeah. a little later yeah. than these origins but it's still fascinating mm -hmm. and it's a really it's one of their earliest um episodes and it's really really good so just to mention that as something that you might want to follow up with but pray continue well as the story goes and i'll just sort of summarize it a little bit that mammoth cheese hung around for a while <laughs> um, as you can imagine it's hard to finish a mammoth cheese and so it was a couple of years in the white house until apparently a mammoth loaf of bread <laughs> this time made by the u.s navy to rally support for the war against the barbary states <laughs> was similarly presented to jefferson uh, to accompany the cheese because you know what's better than cheese and bread <laughs> But apparently all of this did indeed kick off a tradition of mammoth cheeses. As, as we've just said, Andrew Jackson, for instance, also received a giant cheese. But cheese making became more than just a presidential kind of association. It Even here in Canada, we, mm -hmm. we have our own mammoth cheese tradition, apparently. And one such mammoth cheese inspired a work of, shall we call it poetry? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think it gets that term. Well, it inspired a poem, if we can call it that, by James McIntyre, which is often regarded as the worst ever poem in Canadian literary history. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless inspired an annual cheese poetry competition. Yes. In, as you say, the home, his hometown of Ingersoll, Ontario, right? Indeed. So we thought we would finish this episode off with, you know, it's been a little while since I've read poetry to you. <laughs> so instead of some fossil like Catullus or Horace, <laughs> this time... James McIntyre and the Ode on the Mammoth Cheese. And we'll finish off with that. Ode on the Mammoth Cheese. We have seen the Queen of Cheese lying quietly at your ease, gently fanned by evening breeze, thy fair form no flies dare seize. All gaily dressed soon you'll go to the great provincial show to be admired by many a beau in the city of Toronto. <laughs> Cows numerous as a swarm of bees, or as the leaves upon the trees, it did require to make thee please, and stand unrivaled queen of cheese. May you not receive a scar as, we have heard that Mr. Harris intends to send you off as far as, the wor great world's show at Paris. <laughs> Those rhymes are terrible. <laughs> of the youth, beware of these, for some of them might rudely squeeze and bite your cheek. Then songs or glees we could not sing, O Queen of Cheese. Wert thou suspended from balloon, you'd cast a shade even at noon. Folks would think it was the moon about to fall and crush them soon. <laughs> the end. <laughs> ah, so on that note. <laughs> Watch out for falling cheeses. 
and feel free to contribute your continuations of this great work of art in the in the comments if you'd like. And we'll be back in August after taking a break to contemplate cheese. And possibly eat cheese. Oh, um, we'll be eating cheese yeah. at the cottage for sure. Maybe not a mammoth cheese. No, but, but mammoth, mammoth amounts of cheese. cheese. Yes. <laughs> so have a good summer and we'll be back in August. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.